Well, good evening, everybody. It's a few minutes after 8 o'clock, and I had a little bit of a technical issue there trying to get the feed started because when I started the schedule, it actually told me I could not do it for 10 minutes. So that's something I've learned about this particular encoding software that I use, but I think I am on now and everything is good. So Lord willing, we will get started. I pray you all have had a great week and I'm happy to um, have heard from a lot of you uh, throughout the week. And I've got a couple of questions. I only have about five questions tonight. I'll give you a list of what those are for those of you who are starting up. The first one is, what do you do with a teacher in the church who is abusive to his spouse and the church doesn't want to act on that or so-called give him a pass? That's left over from last week. Uh, I have a question today also about birth control. What does the Bible say about these things? Uh, I have a question about prayer request and how we're sort of inundated with prayer request and how we're to really understand what the Scripture teaches us on how and for whom we should pray. Um, I have a question about moving to an area where you can be part of a biblical church and when are we supposed to answer that call and how are we supposed to not be sinful in not answering that call. And a question that I received from last week as well, are there any sins that would permanently disqualify an, a man from the pastorate? What about those he would commit before salvation? So that's sort of where we are getting started tonight. I'll, I'll go a little bit after the 9 o'clock hour so we can get the full hour in. But I'm glad to be able to uh, be with you all today. I see Penny and Park and Rosalie uh, tuning in. Hello and good evening to you all. And uh, I pray the Lord has uh, blessed you this week and given you a lot of joy. And I know that it's um, been good to have the Lord's Day. I know we had a wonderful, wonderful day today with the saints. And for those of you who watch us on our live stream, um, I appreciate the, um, the patience. I don't know why it doesn't show that the audio is not very clear when it's live. But for some reason, after the video is done and processed, it's, it's audible to you. But anyway, we'll, we'll work on that. Thank you all for your patience in that. But yeah, we, we had the Lord's table today. We remembered the death and, uh, and, and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We remembered what it did for us as the church, as the elect. We remember the atonement. We remember the effectual work of Christ to, uh, to satisfy the judgment of God as propitiation. And, uh, you know, we just had a wonderful time in John chapter 7, looking at those who would seek after Christ in their own way, looking at what the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, and the scribes, known as the Sanhedrin, what they thought of Christ and how they influenced the masses uh, in relation to Christ. And we, we saw again where Christ was very emphatic about those w that were not given to the Father. Those who did not know God would never know God, nor would they ever have eternal life if they did not know Jesus Christ, and they could not know Jesus Christ if they were not given to Him by the Father. So we sort of reiterated that, reiterated that truth as it continues in the narrative of John's Gospel, and that's some of the things that um, we're just very excited to be going through. It was week 60 of our sermons in John's Gospel this week, and then Brother Tim's popped in. Hey, brother, good to see you today. And... Uh, Glad to have you on for tonight, and Ron as well. Good to see you. Uh, but we're in uh, today was week sixty in our series on the Gospel of John, and we are about another week or two, probably two, in chapter seven. So it'll be a, several years of a journey, and we're exactly um, how long we don't know. But we're just we're going to take it slow. It's good for the edification of the church. And there's Brother Scott and Brent. Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. All right, so if you have some questions, please post them in the comments. Even after this video is no longer live, please do so. we got 59 minutes to go. Uh, being we got a little bit of a late start due to some technical problems, we're here, and I'm so glad that you're here with us today. The first question that we have, and I have to look at it, is to make sure. Here we go. What do you do with a teacher... <clears throat> All right, let me see here. Let me grab this question real quick and then hide it so that I can uh, put it up there. What do you do with a teacher in the church who abuses his spouse when the church has given him a pass? And I got a little more information, and I spoke to this issue. I think Braden actually asked it last week, Braden Rady. Um, I got a little more information about this, but the bottom line is there's a man in the church who's abusive to his spouse. The church knows about it. The leadership knows about it. He's in a leadership position in the church, but yet it seems to be that the church doesn't care. Um, what what should happen? What are we supposed to do with this issue? Well, here here's the real hard truth about how the church should be. Um, if If a church is not practicing biblical correction, 
also known as biblical church discipline, then it's not operating as a church, and the entirety of the church, including its elders, are, are operating in sin. So and there is no one in the church who is without sin. Okay, let's just say that from the beginning. There's nobody in the church who does not have some sin in their life at some time. So if, whether it be the sin of the mind or desire or temptation where people give too much time to it or whatever, the sins of omission where we're not as faithful as we use, as we should be, uh, you know, we're not as honest as we should be, we're not sharing the gospel like we should be. Uh, there's always going to be some sin at some time in the life of a believer, and the Lord is gracious to show those things to us, and the Lord is gracious to bring those things to light, and the Lord is gracious to remind us, as He shows us in Scripture, that uh, every time I say Scripture, I look for my Bible, uh, shows us in Scripture um, that Christ paid for those sins and that we are satisfactory to God because Christ satisfied the judgment and the wrath and the righteousness of God in His flesh on the cross, and we are vindicated in that sense. We are um, that's not the word I was looking for. We are um, exonerated in that sense. We Christ is vindicated. He is not the sinner. He just took the guilt on himself. And we are righteous because Christ's perfection and his perfect obedience, his righteousness and his humanity is credited to our account. So therefore, there is no sin that would condemn us as Paul would teach us and as James, I mean, as John would teach us and other places in Scripture, but we are not condemned because we are in Christ, because Christ was condemned in our stay. And so I say that from the onset. No one in the church is without sin. No one is perfect. But continually, habitually, sinfully, as people practice certain things in the life of the church, it's a pock against the against the uh, the profession of faith. It's a pock against the gospel of grace. It's a it's it, it's a lie, uh, if you will, when we permit ourselves and others to continue in rebellious sin without any correction. And so discipline by definition, according to the Bible, is correction. The Lord disciplines those He loves, and in doing so, He prunes them and grows them and matures them and teaches them and admonishes them and corrects them. That's done supernaturally through the Holy Spirit, through the reading of the Word. It's done uh, relationally through the life of the local church. It's done administratively through the oversight of the elders as they teach, and, and the list goes on. It's also what we would call, if you go and look at Brother Trey's uh, midweek meeting on the church, um, uh, on the Facebook page here, it's not up on the church website yet, but if you look at Brother Trey, who's an elder candidate in our church, uh, he taught about the graces that God gives to the local assembly, and there's one of those graces that also works after someone has been excommunicated, and that is the grace given through church discipline because it is a means of grace in that context. Not salvifically. We're using that term biblically, so you might want to listen to that before you throw me out to the wolves um, or throw me out with the baby, whichever one fits. Uh, you know, it, it's it's good for the church and that we have washed our hands of those who do not repent. So church discipline is always corrective, and we practice it every single day, every single week in our fellowship. There are people in our church who who we talk to each other, we love each other, we re- rebuke each other, we correct each other, but we do it in the spiritual sense. We do it with the authority of Scripture, not our own personal interests and our personal pet peeves of how people ought to live. Th- this is habitual sin that continues to rob the Christian of their joy, to sever relationships, to cause disunity, and to cause a bad testimony to the public appearance of the people of Christ. Um, So when it comes to a place where somebody is abusive to a spouse, that's a pretty serious issue. It's different than somebody having a habitual uh, laziness. Um, I'm not making light of laziness. It's a sin as well, but it's not something that, you know, we can encourage someone. But, you know, to, to beat your wife or to abuse your wife verbally or physically is not only just sinful and wicked, it's also illegal under the law of the state, uh, of every state in the, in the union. I know that as a fact. And so if someone's doing that, they should immediately be brought under public discipline. Matthew 18 goes out the window in those areas. Matthew 18 is about people personally sinning against you and you trying to make reconciliation. Then you take it to the church after witnesses. But the Scripture shows us that when people are doing sinful things that are immediately... um, obvious and are known that those types of sins are they're called on the carpet immediately and those types of people are corrected in such a way that they are given opportunity to to stop them and the church can love them and come alongside them maybe this man has an anger problem and he needs prayer and he needs encouragement he needs accountability and he needs discipline um but 
to let it go is a bigger issue than this man abusing his wife because it it laughs, it mocks the commands of Christ in the New Testament who tells us to bring correction and bring discipline because God disciplines those he loves so that they can be corrected. See, the true Christian is corrected through the discipline of the Scripture, through the discipline of the brothers and sisters of the church. Um, two weeks ago, we sadly have excommunicated our second member um, because of of adultery. And we're very, very saddened by that. And it was a sudden thing. We found out that there were some problems. And then two or three weeks, within within three weeks, we had to tell the church. And the very next week, we removed him from the membership, you know, unanimously because we don't vote on those things. We agree. We consent to the teaching of the Scripture on those things because this man who is a brother in Christ is not doing that which Christ told him to do. And because of that, we've tried to plead with him, but he refuses, so we cannot give him any more foot gra- foothold uh, to feel like he's getting away with his sin. So we remove him from the membership of the church, and we embrace his family as members of the church, and we hold them tight. See, that's the thing. And in California, we had an issue of discipline on that same issue, um, and it was for a different reason, but in the, in the end, it was always the, it was the same problem. Uh, and the wife in California came to be uh, spiritual in this sense, in some sense came to prove that she was regenerate. And we love everybody. We love the people that we discipline. But at the same time, if the Lord doesn't grant them repentance, then we have no further um, option except to make them as an unbeliever to us, make them, as Jesus would say, as a Gentile, as Paul would say, turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their bodies so that their soul might be saved, because there has to be consequences for continued unrepentant sin and un, uh, sin that is not mortified or put to death. And so church discipline, if it's not practiced, I know this is a long way to answer this simple question, but if church discipline is not practiced openly and publicly, see, I, I was part of a congregation some years ago that they practiced church dis- discipline privately. Listen, we celebrate members who come in covenant. We celebrate the new life of those who make professions of faith and baptism and, 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 and everything else. We also need to weep publicly and lament over those who fall away from the faith and are kicked out of the assembly of the church, out of the intimacy and the covering and the grace of the church and the ministry of the church. Uh, These are public things. That's the reason that the Scripture teaches us to do them, so that there will be clear, it will be clear that we don't tolerate evil, um, but we are gracious toward sin in that sense. And uh, that's what um, that's what we're <laughs> hoping to do in every issue of church discipline. So now back to this question. Somebody who's teaching the church, and it doesn't matter if they're teaching or not. Uh, it could be the person that sits in the very back that never says a thing. If there's knowledge of sin, especially something like this, uh, it needs to be brought up very immediately. You don't need to have a meeting. You don't need to call a council. You don't need to... Somebody, several people need to go to this man and say, we know that you are, by your wife's confession causing harm to her, and we want you to stop that. We are removing you from the leadership of the church. We're telling the church that this is happening so we can come around you and pray, and maybe prayerfully he would be receptive, and you bring him in front of it's 100 people or 1,000 people or 10,000 people, whatever your congregational sign is. You bring this brother into the fellowship of the church, and you say, this is this brother. He's confessing his sin. He's coming before you as his brothers and sisters in Christ and begging the Lord and praying to the Lord, and we're praying with him that he could be loosed or set free or (laughs) put to death this, this heinous sin and if he doesn't, not only is he as communicated, but we're also going to the authorities to let them handle him because that's what you do in the context of these illegal things. Now, this isn't like a lawsuit. We're suing people. to. Th- no, the Bible is clear that we submit to the governing authorities. When we commit a crime, we commit a crime. And if there is a way to forgive, somebody pickpockets me, I can forgive that. If somebody murders me, it doesn't matter if my family forgives them or not. The state will prosecute on those things, and they have all jurisdiction under the Heavenly Father to do so and under the Word of God to do so. So I believe that if a church has someone in their midst, whether they're a leader or not, who is abusive, it needs to be made known to the church immediately. Um, and I do agree that the elders should be the one that takes it to the church, but it should be immediately. You can't wait for months. You can't dig around and talk about these things and all because this woman is hurting And by not dealing with this man's sinfulness to the protection of the fake unity and the fake piety of the church, 
for the sake of some kind of public image. We're actually damaging the sister um, by commending the sin and saying to her and to her household, you're not as important as the outward appearance of what we want people to think we have and think we are. So that's how I would answer that question. And it would work very quickly in our fellowship. We would we would bring this to light probably within one week. Um, and it would probably be within a couple of days just through email or letter. Uh, we prefer email. We prefer in person. But if we can't do it in person, we would do that <clears throat> in that regard. And then within a couple of weeks, if there's no repentance, if there's no opportunity, like if this brother decided, well, I'm not coming back to church, he would be brought under excommunication um, immediately. And we would deal with the consequences therein. If he came and says, I am sorry, then we would bring him out of the leadership of the church. The church would pray for him. So that's how, that's how we would do that. Friends, this is the, this is the deal breaker for a lot of folks. They don't want to be a part of assembly who practices discipline, but you know what? It protects me and it protects the congregation. It protects the other elders in our church. It protects all of us because everyone knows in our assembly that they are never going to have to hear, um, of, the covered up sin of their pastors or the covered up sin of their leaders or the covered up sin of their teachers. It's not going to happen. We're not going to do it. Um, we want to be forthright. And here's the beautiful thing. In all of that, there is never condemnation. There is always forgiveness. So we're able to, if the Lord grants repentance to these several people that we through the years have had to excommunicate, we will celebrate and we will rejoice in such a way. You take, you talk about kill the fatted calf, dude. We will slaughter the whole herd. We will have steaks and potatoes for years when these brethren come back to the faith and come back to Christ and come back to to restoring their marriages and their homes and and all of that. We just long for those things. So that's that's how I would deal with that. Now you're not a leader in the church, maybe you're not an elder, you're not a pastor, you don't have the the platform. You go to your pastors and you don't demand it. You just take the Bible and say, listen, the word of God demands that we exercise discipline on this issue and it must be done and it needs to be done in a few days. And you say to them, do you agree or you disagree with this? And if they disagree with this, my, my plans or my advice to you is to leave with prejudice humbly that assembly because that assembly is not a biblical church and it is not healthy and it does not honor God at all. And I would love to to get involved in this, if it's something that I can help coach you in, uh, counsel you in, or help the elders, because sometimes pastors just don't know what to do. That they don't teach this stuff uh, to us when we're preparing in seminary. Uh, if we would learn the Word of God instead of all these other things, we would be better prepared to deal with these things. But putting it into practice, it's a very serious issue. Um, and people will accuse you, well, you're gossiping. No, nope, I'm not gossiping. You're stirring division. You better be right you're stirring division, but you're not stirring division in the context of what Paul tells Titus and all these other people. You're not stirring division to destroy the unity of the church. You're being divisive because of the fact that the church is continuing in sin because they're not exercising discipline. And it doesn't mean you get on this campaign of trying to make it happen and hurt the church. But you must stand firm on what is good for the sake of this brother. He needs discipline so that he can be corrected. If we don't correct him, it's like we don't love him. Anyway, I'll get off that. I don't mean to spend 15 minutes on that thing. But uh, that, that may cause some of you to have more questions than, than less. I'd love to talk about church discipline. Uh, someone asked me, I'm thinking about doing a one once a month long just exposition uh, on a specific topic, and one of those is has been ecclesiology. What does the true church look like? What does the Bible teach about the church and its polity, etc.? And I know there are a lot of opinions on that, but the Scripture teaches to those things and speaks to those things very clearly. So I, I'm probably going to plan that maybe in sometime in September, Lord willing. This question, what does the Bible teach about family planning and birth control? Are these matters of conscience? This came to me this afternoon right after our assembly by one of our church members. And the question was a little bit longer, but they've been having discussions with their children and with their adult children about these issues. Um, let's talk about what the Bible actually says about children and about family. Uh, so let's start from the beginning. In Genesis um, chapter 2, we see that the scripture teaches that God created male and female and put them together, and the two became one flesh. Paul refers, and the word for that alludes, he looks back uh, to the creation account, 
in Ephesians chapter 5 and then also Colossians 3, but most specifically Ephesians chapter 5 when he says that, you know, man and wife have come together and the two have become one flesh. He says, I know that this mystery is profound, but I say it refers to Christ in the church. So marriage in its sense, in its perfect sense, is a shadow of the eternal picture of the church of Jesus Christ redeemed through his uh, redemptive work on the cross. Uh, so that's what marriage is for. It's to show, as a mentor of mine told me 15 years ago, it's a microscopic image of a microcosmic reality of Christ in the church. So it's a little tiny picture. And we know that marriage is not is not permanent. It's temporal. No one will be given in marriage in eternity because it's unnecessary, just like there's no temple worship today because it's unnecessary. There's no sacrifices today because they are unnecessary. Christ is the fulfillment of that. So in the last days, in the days of the Lord, when all is set and rectified, Ephesians 1.10, Ephesians 3.10, etc., uh, we will not be given in marriage because marriage will have passed away, and the true marriage of Christ and His church will be established, visible, and we will come back. Uh, I mean, we will come to that full awareness of that. So when it comes to children then. So marriage is a picture of the gospel. Children is all, are also a picture of the gospel. The Bible teaches and he commands, God commands the first couple to multiply, to come together and multiply, to continue to have children so that they may subdue the earth. But you understand this command comes before the fall. And the fall then, of course, decreed by God before the foundations of the world, that's called superlapsarianism. Matter of fact, I might even have a question about that lecture from last week. I can't remember. Um, uh, came in at the last minute, and I meant to put it in this week. I'll look at it in a second. Either way, uh, we we know that the fall came, and so we know the consequences of the fall leave an imperfect world, leave an imperfect understanding of the world, leave an imperfect understanding of the decrees of God, and a perfect un- an imperfect, I'm saying that too fast, an imperfect understanding, all those that were imperfect, imperfect understanding of everything associated with marriage and the gospel and everything. So we have to continue to look at the Scripture and have it revealed to us by the Holy Spirit as we study. It's just not normal in the natural state. An unregenerate person cannot understand and comprehend the things of God. So the world at large doesn't understand marriage. The world at large doesn't understand children. The world at large doesn't understand family. The world at large doesn't understand work. The world at large does not have a biblical worldview whatsoever because the world at large is blind. So when we think of it that way, we need to understand that when it comes to matters of marriage and family, the American way is that oh, I need to find somebody that I like and that I think looks nice and that I think I can get along with and then I'll marry them and I'll have a family and I'll do what I want to do and they'll do what they want to do and we'll do what we want to do together. And it's all about us and it's all about what we can build and it's all about what we can provide. And then we'll have children when we're ready. We'll do children if we want to. Some people don't want children at all because they like ski trips and they like shopping, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the purpose of marriage is to display the gospel, and part of the gospel display is to have children. But what we can't do is come to the understanding about what happens when people can't have children or what what happens when people are in a place where they know they shouldn't have children. They have discernment and wisdom that they know they should not have children. Or what about when you come to the place where somebody's told by a doctor, you don't need to have any children? Um, so it comes to the matter of the heart. Why does someone not to want to have children? You know, I hear a lot. I mean, I marry very few couples because I require such extensive premarital preparation and counsel. Uh, that's pretty. It's pretty hard to to tolerate. I'll be honest with you. Uh, the couples that I marry, they 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 really work hard, and it's for their good. Uh, but at the same time. A lot of people come to me and say, hey, will you, will you marry us? Uh, will you perform a wedding for us? No, I will not. Not without this council and not without you being part of the local church because it doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to bear that on my conscience. And we always talk about family. We always talk about children. And I like for them to write this down. Write down how many children you want to have each separately and hand it to me. And it's always funny because they've never talked about it. They've made plans. They know what color the dresses are going to be. They know where they're going on the honeymoon. They know all this stuff. They know where they're going to live and what kind of job they're going to have. But neither of them have ever spoken hardly, almost almost holistically, about how many children they want. And um, when I was young, before I was married, and then when I, ma- when I got married, I wanted 10 children. I only ended up with five, but I wanted 10, and my wife wanted two. And uh, I didn't know that until a year into the marriage. And, uh, you know, we're talking about, I'm going, 
two kids, man, that's not that's not enough, you know. I want ten kids. Maybe we can have eight. We'll compromise. We'll take your two from my ten, and we'll we'll be done with it. Uh, but anyway, we, we we never really talked about that. So when I ask that question, it's always interesting because every single time it's always different. And then I ask the question, when do you want to start having children? And there's usually always a pause. And the man will say, well, right away, you know, because, I mean, let's be honest, man. We don't bear a lot of the load of responsibility on in the infant days, but the, the wife does, the mother does. So sometimes mothers say right away. Sometimes men say right away, more often than mothers do. But then I ask when they say, well, not right away. We don't know. We haven't thought about that. And I ask, well, what would keep you from having children? And the answer that says we really just don't know, uh, we haven't prayed about it, I, ex- I respect that answer. Uh, some people say, well, I want to finish my school, whatever. I respect that answer. I'm not saying that these are good reasons. I'm just saying I respect those answers because they're, they're, they're pre- preparatory. Because here's the reality of it. God's people are not going to stop God from giving them a baby when he's ready. And so we're not going to pretend like we can control what God's going to do. But I oftentimes, and I have, and I don't marry couples this way. <laughs> so for those of you who see this, you come to me years later. Well, you do our way. Don't tell me this because I will cancel it right then because I just don't think you're prepared. People say, well, I, you know, we've got a lot of plans. We want to travel and we want to do this and we want to have a good time. We want to enjoy our youth. And then we'll think about having kids. I will not perform a wedding for somebody like that because that is an issue of selfishness, putting the marriage on their terms, putting putting children on their terms, and putting things that God has ordained for the purpose of His glory centered on their selfishness. Now, I know there's exceptions to some of these, and we walk through them. And I'm not so dogmatic to say, well, I, no, I listen to what they say, and usually they're just slipping. But people who stand on that firmness of selfishness, that they're not going to have children until they get through with all the good things. that they, Listen, what good things are there? I mean, really, what's a better what's a better rehearsal for being a a good Christian in the local assembly than to have a family with children? What's a better opportunity to understand the gospel than to have family with children? So I think it's very difficult. What does birth control have to do with that? Well, sometimes people have an issue of they just don't feel they're ready for children. So some people are fearful of children. So it's an issue of counsel. That's why people have to be in the local church. I think that it's a matter of counsel where they can get around people who can counsel them in the Word of God to show that the Bible teaches that children are a blessing from the Lord. Why would we not want a blessing from the Lord? You know what the number one cause uh, or the answer when I ask that? Because we just can't afford it. You can't afford children. No, you can't afford children. But you know what? You can afford children. They're, it's just the way it is. And what if you can't afford children and everything's good and you got this good job going, Johnny, and all of a sudden after the child's born and turns, you know, six months old, you hurt your leg and you're out and you have no, then what do you do? You know, so are we trusting in the Lord? So I think it must be, most importantly, it must be an issue of faith. Everything that is done not in faith is sin. If we don't do what we do by faith, it is sinful. So when we when we use contraceptives because we're not trusting in the Lord, it's sinful. But if we use contraceptives because we say we feel like in our conscience right now it would not be wise for us to have children because of our service to the Lord or for our service, I, I don't know. I don't know how that would work because I can't make that work for my life. Uh, but maybe you could, and I wouldn't tell you to violate your conscience in that, but I would counsel you to make sure that you're not using fear as your motivator, but that you are doing so by faith. So if you can use birth control by faith, then by all means use it. If you can't, please don't. Um, So that is one of those areas. And and I don't want to take hard determinate lines on that because I do believe that some people, for example, for example, um, you know, when we were in California, we talked about it, we prayed about it, and we thought, we don't know how long I'm going to be here. I'm not so sure right now. We drive four hours a day. I don't know right now would be the best thing for us to to have children. So we prayed about it. We came to this conclusion we did not want to plan to have children. But at the same time, we knew that God could give us children. Then we come back to Georgia. 
and we have we have more children. So that's that's all in the time and the plan of the Lord. So I think that it's important that we we don't tell young people, especially, no, it's sinful to you know you get pregnant immediately. I don't think that any of those areas are so hard lined that we should give that type of I think we should teach them what the scripture teaches that children are a blessing that the fruit of a womb is is an amazing heritage of the Lord yes um <clears throat> yeah the quiverful movement I mean just I don't I don't fall for those things it's almost cultish I, and I'm, I'm saying that loosely and I'm saying that tenderly but it's it's wrong because if that is the true immediate always purpose of God, then what do we do with so many young girls that, that I've counseled as couples when they come to me and say, Pastor, we, we, can't, we can't have a child. Something's wrong with one of us. We can't have a child. Are they barren because of a curse of God? Of course not. That's not the truth. That's not what now, of course, the Old Testament, God did close the wombs of women as a curse, but that's not the purpose of God in the, the inability to have children in this present day for His people. And I've seen God give people who could not have children children, and we celebrate that. And I've seen God take children away from people who could have many children, and we've seen that, and we've celebrated that even with tears. And so I just want us to be tender on this issue and not dogmatic because the Scripture is not dogmatic on that. And I know I seem to spend a lot of time on the questions tonight, but I think that's what the Bible teaches about family planning, that it must be done by faith and that we must recognize that we can't be governed by fear and we can't be governed by fun. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to make decisions like that. Um, outside of the will of God. And most importantly, we should pray and gain counsel. If the Lord, if the Lord is truly the heartbeat of our of our hope, then we will come to the conclusion that it is time and when it is time to have a family. And believe it or not, God's going to give it to us in his timing, not our own. And so I think that the better thing to do is to prepare prayerfully and plan accordingly. And then by all means, do everything by faith. But I do encourage every couple, please, if you are married and able, have children. Um, and there are some people who can't, and they do adopt. And I believe all families should adopt if you're able to. It's a good thing. So, Lord, bless for that question. It's a difficult one, and I pray that it would come a way for, um, for more discussion. It's a very, very good question, and it's a very sensitive question. Because people, like Dr. Queller have already said, there are so many movements out there that say, you know, this is evil if you don't, you know. Let's, let's not go there. Let's be sensitive to the work of the Lord and the work of uh, God's people. Thank you all for that question. Very good question. All right. This, uh, oh, goodness, I can't remember who, who asked this question. Spencer, maybe. Um, in light of, yeah, y'all don't know what that means. Let me read this, and then this is the question. Uh, when we get on Facebook, we are inundated with requests to pray for this person or that situation. The requests often come from people who may be, quote, American civil religionists, end quote, or even from people who are quite eclectic, asking us to summon whatever, quote, positive vibes we can. In light of this, how do we choose for whom and what to pray? Is there a scriptural way to prioritize and or choose for whom and what to pray? Um, here's, here's the thing that we need, to, we need to remember. The Bible commands us to pray. The Bible commands us to pray for all things as the will of the Lord is done. Your will be done, Father. Jesus teaches us the model prayer. Uh, we see the book of James teaching us to pray. We see, we see Paul teaching us to pray for what? For leaders. What do we pray for them? That they may live a peaceful life. Uh, we're, we're, we're taught to pray for our enemies, etc. Um, but what, what do we do in the context of always? Somebody asked me several months ago, should I pray for the Lord to the Lord about my truck loan or my house loan? And I say yes. Uh, my my grandmother who passed away uh, 13 years ago, January 28, 13 years ago, my maternal grandmother. Um, I ended up with a lot of her journals that she wrote in, and there was one from back in the 80s when my grandfather was in seminary and they were going around and they were trying to sell a piece of property and and do some things. And she would always write out her prayers. And I have one particular journal where she wrote something of this nature. If I if I'd known this question was coming up, I could have dug it out of a uh, file. And it's this long three or four page prayer, basically saying, "Father, your will be done in this. 
but we pray that you would permit us to sell this house, to do this, to do that. Father, work out all things according to the counsel of your will, stated just that way, that things would all be done for your name's sake and for your glory and for our good. And then she laid out what she wanted the Lord to do and how he wanted, how she hoped and prayed that he would work and then closes that prayer out with almost the same sentiment that she opened it with, that your will would be done. All right. So there's never a wrong opportunity or a wrong thing to pray about. If we're praying in the right spirit, we're praying with the right heart and mind that the will of the Lord is done. But my daily podcast this past week was about the things that hinder our prayers. And I think that's where this comment came from. Uh, Selfishness hinders our prayers. So we should not pray selfishly. We should not pray for that which God prohibits. We should not pray out of a out of a desire for greed uh, because greed is sinful. So we can't pray from a greedy heart. Uh, We can't pray from a worldliness perspective, from a, from a fleshly perspective. Um, So we don't want to pray for things that are frivolous. We don't want to pray, you know, um, I I can't even think of a frivolous thing to pray for, but I mean, because I don't want to make fun of someone and then it be an issue that some of you may go, well, hey, I prayed for that. Uh, but we don't. We should not pray uh, imprecatory prayers. We, I don't believe we should pray those things because Jesus says to pray for our enemies. So, um, however, I ha- I do pray imprecatory prayers in some sense, in a in the same breath. You might say, what's an imprecatory prayer? Pray that God would do something damaging. Uh, I pray for people who are living in sin, my brothers and sisters in the Lord who are living in sin, that God would not give them joy in their sin because that's the will of the Lord, that his people don't find joy in sin. So it seems like an imprecatory prayer to me, but that's part of God's blessing on them is that they would hate sin and that he would ruin the plans of the wicked. Uh, but I don't pray for the destruction of the wicked because I pray for the salvation of the wicked. Does that, does that make sense? There's a difference in what we see the psalmist praying for in the enemies of God and we see uh, as, as, first, as New Testament Christians, we pray for our enemies in that sense. So when it comes to the Scripture, to answer this question directly, uh, it, it is inundating to see constantly, you know, pray for this, pray for that, pray for this, pray for that. Um, here's, here's where I don't pray. Uh, I'm not praying for God to put prayer back in schools. That's silly um, because prayer's never left school. It's never left school because if there are Christians in school, then there's prayer in school. I don't want, my children are, are educated at home, um, but they have been in institutionary uh, academies and private school and they, for a six-month period in uh, Alameda County, were in, <laughs> were, were in a public school um, and it was a big mistake. But um, I didn't want people praying over my children. I don't want heretics praying in the name of Jesus in front of my children. Just like I want, I don't want people preaching uh, in 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 front of my children uh, heretical things and worldly things and fleshly things. I don't want people teaching my children to twist the scripture. I don't care that people think. A lot of times people think that this is godly because it has the Bible or it has the word God in it. You know, in God we trust. You know, the God that we trust in in America is the devil. Uh, it's not the God of the Bible because no one holistically sees Christ at all as God in our culture. Never has, if you think about it. But that's a whole nother comment. Uh, I do teach a class on American church history. We might we might put that online in the weeks and, or in the years to come. But who knows? Uh, get a little more gray-headed, I might put that online. But when it comes to praying, and I don't pray for stuff like that. I don't pray. I do pray for the leaders. Uh, I do pray for things that I see that, that might be happening. But most importantly, I pray for those things that I see happening around me. I pray for the people that are close to me. I pray for the church that I shepherd. I pray constantly and all the time. I can't imagine a time when I'm not trying to pray, even if it's slipping prayer in between thoughts of other things. Because I'll be honest, beloved, we we must be constantly in a state of prayer. We must be constantly in a state of talking to God, not just thinking about Him. Uh, Not just wondering and pondering about the circumstances, but praying that God's Word would come to the rescue and that God's work would be effectual in in these circumstances. I pray for my neighbors that live across the street here. I pray for my neighbors that live to my left here. Uh, I pray for the groups of people that I minister to every single day. 
I pray for the lost and I pray for those around me that I that I get to meet online who are who are displaced or who are sick or who are hurting and I pray that God would work all of the suffering in a way that would give the joy that they can only find in Christ in the midst of the tears but as they weep and mourn they do so as Paul tells the Thessalonians with those who as those who have hope. And so I pray a lot. Um, but when I get a message on Facebook, would you pray for this? I, I usually don't. Uh, no, no, not when you message me, but when I get these these spam messages, you know what I'm talking about. These spam messages that are constantly to you know pray for this because you know we need to, we need to keep that cross up in New Mexico. We don't need a cross. There was only one cross that needed to hang in this world, and it's already been taken down. And the Christ's body, the Christ's body came off the cross, and he was put in the dirt, and he rose to life, never to get on the cross again. The cross is finished. I don't need to have one hanging out for my freedom of religion. The freedom of my religion is in Christ. Whether I'm chained and bound in chains or not. Now I'm a constitutional. Don't get me wrong, but Christ is bigger than the Constitution. So I don't need to pray for that. I don't need to pray for prayer in schools. I don't need to pray that God would do a great work in Capitol Hill. What I can pray, though, is that God would save all those lost politicians, all of them, every party. They're all lost. None of them seek after Christ. None of them proclaim the gospel. None of them that I see now, let me be specific, none of them that are in the limelight. Um, have ever orchestrated out of their mouth the gospel of grace um, that came from their heart. So we can we can play it all we want to. So when I pray that the Lord's will is done in those types of situations, I pray first and foremost that God would bring destruction or blessing, whatever it takes to bring people to repentance, whatever it takes for Him to be glorified. But here's the honest truth, church. Here's the honest truth, friends, is that we have a greater opportunity, a greater expectation of seeing God bring calamity among, up to the United States in order to bring repentance than blessing. Uh, and that calamity would be the blessing because what? Through the calamity, through the suffering, God's people would rise up and be counted in Christ rather than being counted in their nationality. So I'm not really sure. That's one of those things that, uh, that it's just very difficult um, that it's it's hard to play, but I, I'm gonna tell you I, the inundation. I know what you're talking about. It is aggravating to have, and especially when they do it like this. And if you send this out to 20 people, God will do something great. Uh, and if you, <laughs> Scott, I'm not gonna say that on the air, but uh, anyway, uh, that was funny. But uh, you, um, I lost my train of thoughts. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. Uh, somebody just sent me a text, and it was really funny, but I'm not gonna say it on the air. Uh, what was I saying? Wow, my brain just went out of the... Went out of the anyway, whatever I was saying. Oh, these uh, chain things that say, if you pray this and then you send it to 20 people, God will do this. If you don't, you don't love Jesus. You know what? Delete that. I don't love that, Jesus. I don't want to do that kind of stuff. But we do need to pray... Um, you know, when people send me prayer requests of things that I'm not familiar with, I can pray very quickly, Lord, this... Whatever this is, this circumstance that people are asking for prayer, I pray first and foremost that they would know the true Christ and have salvation. And most of all, that you would work this for the counsel of your own will and the perfection of your own decree and the outcome of your own plan. And that's enough. So I've prayed and I don't have to. And then some things do strike me. But if I know people, sure, I pray for them. Uh, but all these spammy prayer requests, no. I, I just, we don't have time for that. And it's it's constant. And here's, and here's because here's what I've usually seen. That follows up with, and here's a link to the donate button. Uh, or here's a link to this. Or here's a link to that. Or here's a petition to sign to get, you know, Bibles handed out. I don't want Bibles handed out in the schools either. I don't want school administrators handing out Bible and preaching a false gospel. I don't want other world religions having that same. I don't want that. If my children were in school and Christian children that I know that go to the school just down the road from here and other other teachers who are believers, they teach, they preach, they teach the scripture, they pray, they exercise their rights as individuals, but it's not mandated by the school. So there's still prayer in school. There's still Christians in, in government. There's still things that God is doing in the midst of it all. So we can rejoice. And I think that's an area where we pray. And Ron, great. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, rejoice always, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so most of all, we can rejoice in our, in our, in our prayers. Very good question. All right. 
And this question came to me just this evening, like one minute before the bell. And uh, I will let its uh, asker be anonymous presently. But if being with the biblical church requires you to relocate. Now, we've talked about that a lot. And some of you have talked to me about relocating. And there's some of you that listen to this broadcast that are in part, a part of uh, a group that we're a part of. You know, you have no local church. And we're praying that God would plant churches in your area. Um If you need to relocate, the question is, when does resisting that relocation become sinful? (laughs) Well, if God has called you to leave to be part of a local church and you don't, it's sinful immediately. Um, Now, you have to put things in order. You have to sell a house like some people have, you know, recently been doing. and, and, And you have to sometimes get a job, but sometimes you have to, by faith, go and then get a job. Sometimes you have to, by faith, go and then worry about all the bells and whistles. But I think if you're working with the local congregation and you're giving people the information that 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 is necessary, the church will give you good counsel. And most of all, they will pray for you and give, and God will give you the wisdom, James chapter 1, and the strength to carry out the call. Abraham trusted God and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. So if you feel the desire to leave where you live and have lived for years to be part of a local church and you know this is the call of God and you don't do it, it becomes sinful. Don't resist it. Just back to the issue about children. Um, Don't be ruled by fear but be ruled by faith, the law of faith, the law of Christ, the law of love. Let the Lord... Do that, and that's why the local church is so important. Because if you have a true Bible teaching Christian fellowship that 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 holds the Word of God as the highest authority, we won't have to worry about uh, whether we're being led astray because it'll be it'll be exegetical, it'll be contextual. So we will have everything that we need in order to know what we need to be doing. Um, but there are some people who say, "Well, you know, I I know I need to leave and find a local church, but." I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I mean, I, I just don't comprehend that because, uh, you know, 21 years ago, I answered the call to ministry and I've been moving ever since. I've been going ever since. I've been leaving ever since. I've been accepting the call of God without even knowing if or how much the salary was. And it's silly for me to do that. It was really dumb. Everywhere you go, or the support, or whatever the word you want to call it. You know, it was silly for us to come and plant a church in Georgia and bootstrap it and just hope for the best. But we hope for the best because we are trusting the best. We are trusting the sovereign God of the universe. And we cannot expect it to be easy. We cannot expect our Christian faith to take us down a lazy river of awesome expectations. Uh, we, we need to recognize that fighting the fight of faith is sometimes fighting to be in part of the local church. Sometimes, I mean, God may be calling some of you brothers out there to be trained in the ministry. We do that. We will train you. It'll take you two or three years to be prepared, but we will help train you to be a pastor because knowing the Bible and the theological doctrines of the Bible is important and most important, but there are a lot of things in the Bible pastorally that are overlooked because people forget that that's part of the doctrine of Scripture. And so guys that can get up and preach a good gospel, that's first and foremost, but secondly, (laughs) sometimes they, they just don't they don't know anything else. They don't know what the Bible teaches about the, sh- the church. My, they don't know what they're supposed to do in the sense of, of, of shepherding people and the heart they're supposed to have. See, a true pastor has a heart for people. He's never angry with his church. He's never harsh with his church. And when he feels like doing so, the Spirit of God crushes that stuff. Why? Because he's praying for them and he loves them. Look at the, look at the illustration of Moses. Look at that pastoral position. I use it very loosely. It's not even same but look at his heart he'd be so frustrated with the church and then god would come along and say okay i'm gonna i mean with israel and he's got to come along and say okay let's just smite them all and he'd go no 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 no. don't don't hurt them i love them let, let me just be patient with them and so we must be patient and and that's something that you can't just learn by reading a book or or going to a seminar you have to be accountable to that 
Humility comes by the Holy Spirit through accountability. A man that's not sat under another man's teaching for a season is not worthy or equipped to be in a pastorate. And a man who's not been taught by a true shepherd's heart, someone with a shepherd's heart is not equipped to be a shepherd. You can't be self-called. And well, as my grandfather used to always say, mama, mama called and daddy sent. Mamas always say, that's my little preacher. And when you turn 18, daddy sends you out the door. Uh, that's, that's not biblical. It's not healthy. And, you know, so we, we help train men for the work of the ministry. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping and praying with collectively with a few other congregations and some pastors to, to develop this. And, and some of you may be called to plant a church in your area. Well, it's not going to be something you can do overnight. You can't, number one, there's nowhere for you to look to see a healthy example, um, a large healthy example of a New Testament church that functions biblically. I'm sorry, but you see all the stuff you're supposed to do rather than the people that you're supposed to be. So <laughs> there's the next book I'll write, the stuff you're supposed to do versus the people you're supposed to be uh, that'll never get done. So that, that's, that's how I would answer that question. It becomes sinful when we fail to respond to the call of God. And it also becomes sinful if we are fickle in that call. If God has called us and then we press toward that end, obstacles are going to get in the way. Things are going to cause us stress. Things are going to come up that we might go, oh, I don't know. Wow, let me debunk the microphone. Maybe this isn't the thing. No, if God's called you then, God's called you now. And see, we have that situation sometimes for people who want to leave the church um, that they're in because something's not going their way. It's evil. It's immaturity. It's fickleness. It becomes sinful in that sense when they fail to be in the assembly. That's why the Bible teaches that when we're not in the assembly, it's one of those areas where it's it's a dangerous place because it's a sign of some weakness and immaturity on the part of the believer when there is a church now uh, and they leave. And, you know, we're working through that as well. We have some families who, who just don't... Uh, aren't coming back and they're not communicating exactly what they want. And, and we're trying to discern, are they weak or are they rebellious? And if we discover they're rebellious, then we're going to discipline them. Uh, and, and preferably they'll correct them and they'll come back. That's what we want to see. Uh, the same thing is true when we're looking to be in the church and we stop. Because maybe somebody else has said something, or maybe we don't. Listen, if God's called you, God will seal you in that calling and provide for you in and along the way, no matter how hard the journey is going to be. It's going to be hard. It is not easy. It is never simple to answer the call of God. If it is, it's not the call of God. I'm sorry to say that. All right. What sin disqualifies a man from the eldership permanently? How about prior to salvation? Um, I would say that divorcing your wife um, would disqualify you from the eldership. But prior to salvation, I have a real hard time holding a man's sins against him when Christ has forgiven them. But therein, let's let's piggyback a little bit on the training issue that I talked about in the last um, in the, in the last question. If we are part of a local church, and we know the circumstances, and we expressly work toward reconciliation, and reconciliation takes place according to Scripture, then the man can be qualified. But if the man just like, eh, I I left her because she aggravated me, and I'm still a pastor. No, 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 no. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, and don't even get me started about how churches operate, and they're getting resumes, and they're calling guys, and all this kind of stuff. That that is so evil, uh, the way those things operate. It just... I have come to see what the Scripture teaches about that. I told Brother Trey tonight after dinner, I think we're writing the book on ecclesiology that's never been written, and it'll probably never be read, but Lord bless, we need to know what the Bible teaches about the church. And so that's sort of the only thing that I see uh, would disqualify a man from the eldership permanently. But when it comes to prior to salvation, I think that those are issues that we need to see the maturity of this brother and see that he comes to understand the call, understand that. I mean, he's he's got to be restored in some sense to his wife if he wants to be an elder, um, you know, if he divorced her. And so that's that's something that, um, it's, it's a tough one because I really don't want to take the next nine minutes to answer that in depth. But I can't remember who, if it was Brandon or Braden, who asked that question. But if you want to expound upon it, I will spend more time on it next week. How about we do that?
Okay, can you explain empiricism and evidentialism? Uh, these are <clears throat> processes, of, not processes, these are categories of apologetics, if you will, uh, in the sense of talking about the Christian faith. Uh, when we look at the truth and we look at trying to find the truth and we try to find evidence to support the truth, that is what that is talking about. Unless I'm in the wrong boat, and if I am... Um, uh, Sonny and Cheryl, y'all let me know, and I'll be glad to expound upon that. If not tonight, I'll expound upon that. So when it comes to empiricism, that is looking for the foundations of truth. Evidentialism is looking for evidence that supports those foundations of truth in that sense. Um, we do not hold as a church or as a ministry to evidentialism. Uh, we do not hold to uh, you know classical apologetics. We hold to a presuppositional platform. And more or less, I call it something completely different. I think that apologetics, according to what the Scripture teaches, is exegesis uh, and exposition. So we're expositional apologists. In other words, when somebody has a question, we answer it based on what the Scripture reveals to us, not on the evidences or the truth claims or or things of that nature that may or may not be... Um, uh, beneficial or even supported in that context of Scripture. We don't have to come up with evidence to undergird the teaching of Scripture. Now, if that's not what you're talking about, if you're talking about more the philosophical area or arena of those things, I'd be glad to give some time to that sometime in the sometime in the future. All right, Sean has a question here, and this is a long one. It may not fit on the screen. My question goes along with the one you're currently answering. When you seemingly don't have a church near you that lines up exactly with what you believe to be biblically true theologically, how do you decide where to attend? What do you look for in a new church when you love to a new, when you move to a new area? I'm thinking that's what you mean. Um, let, let me say this, Sean. Uh, you don't move to a new area if you haven't found a local assembly to be a part of. Uh, and I know that's tough for people to swallow, but... It, your faith and your and your fellowship around the faith is the primary purpose of your existence. So the church that you are in intimacy with and covenant with is the reason you go anywhere, not the job. You don't say, oh, I got a new job offer, now let's find a church. It does not work that way. Uh, I think it's a very unbiblical and unwise but very common practice. We've all done it. It's the common place. It's like when you turn 16, you start dating and trying out possible spouses. It's, it's unbiblical. It doesn't work. You're in covenant with people who are not your spouse. So in the same way, we're going and taking jobs, and then we get there and we go, wow, we don't have a church. We don't have a family. We don't have that. But see, that, that therein lies the problem of how we think about the local church. We often in our culture think of the local church as this place that we go to rather than this people that we covenant with. And, and it shows it shows. Uh, the church is not the building. May God burn all the church buildings down that the church might actually repent and, 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 be, and, and be pure and, and be Christ-centered and be gospel-centric. Uh, but no, I fear that they'd just start a building program and a fundraiser and everybody'd kumbaya at a bonfire until they got the thing rebuilt and it'd be the same old, same old. Why? Because that's what unregenerate people do. Um, how do you decide where to attend? Well, last week I talked about some of the elements of a true church. Go listen, Sean, to last week's uh, Theology On Call last Sunday night and look at some of the things. But specifically in recap, your church must hold to a confession of faith that is sound, that is the true gospel. And I'm about to say something that's going to burn some people. The Baptist faith and message is not right. Uh, it's not right. It is contradictory every side of the road. It is like turn left to right by going right. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I came to see this back in 2003, and um, life changed for me. Um, most people have never even read it, so uh, we don't we don't hold to that. We don't we don't do that. We hold to the London Baptist Confession. There's some verbiage there that is that's convoluted, and because of the way the words are used in our present day, they're 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 misunderstood. We're correcting those misunderstandings from a contextual <laughs> from a contextual point of view with Scripture. Uh, but we hold to that. We hold to Scripture, of course. But there's a true gospel, a true statement of faith. We all you also need to look at pastors who exposit completely. They don't just flip around in a preaching calendar. We're going to teach about this this month and this that month and this this month. And we have a teach. You know, no, 
stay away from any type of community-driven, topical-type preaching. Uh, it'll starve you and your family to death. It'll starve It'll starve you spiritually. Um, and also, they must practice church discipline. If they don't practice church discipline publicly, don't even consider going there because it'll be an unhealthy place. Um, and, and the list goes on and on. And so go and look there. Um, it's tough, brother. I'm telling you. I feel like we're in the days, and this is going to sound so weird, but I feel like we're in the days uh, like the Reformers, and they just think, where is the church? Where are the Christians? Where are the truth sayers? Where are the expositors? Where are the shepherds for the church of Jesus Christ? Where is the gospel? Where is Jesus? Where are all the believing ones? Where are they? They're playing softball and doing hot dog suppers, and they're having a good time tossing rings and horseshoes and everything else, but they're not learning and living the scripture. They're allowing and permitting sin to can run rampant in the church without correction. They're willing to compromise truth for a false unity so that they can pretend like they have some type of intimacy, which it's not intimate at all. And the list goes on. I feel that way in our culture. I feel like there's such a small number of pastors and congregations who want to see the gospel proclaimed, but there's so many people who hold on to the glory that comes from men to their demise because the Bible says that those people are not born again. So that's sort of what we do. And uh, go back and listen to last week at that at that list. Maybe maybe some of you can help me write it out. We could put it up on the blog as a written post. But um, yeah, those are some those are some non negotiable, Sean. And uh, brother, I'm praying for you in the circumstance that you're in too, because I, I I know I know what you're going through, and I love you, and I pray that things are are, are turning around for you in that regard. Oh, yes, we do need another reformation. I tell you, it's it's really. It's really frustrating. Well, brothers and sisters, that's two minutes. That's an hour uh, that goes by fast. Wow, that went by very, very fast. I want to thank you all for, for joining in. These questions are really good. I feel like I didn't give enough time to a couple of them. So if you, that was your question, I can't remember who all asked what, and you need further explanation, please post it in these comments here or send me a message on Facebook. Um and I'll be glad to give more time to those uh, to those questions. And as always, you can hear our podcast over at anchoringfaith.org. You can see more about our church and our teaching ministry there at gracetruth.org. And um, mark in your calendars. We're going to live stream it, but those of you who are in the Cincinnati area in October 14th-ish, uh, we're going to be doing a um, we're going to be doing a conference together with some gospel, some sovereign grace gospel pastors and congregations. So uh, keep in, keep that open. And the next spring, uh, we are going to be hosting our first conference here as a church on the person of the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we're excited about that around the 17th dish of May 2019. So I pray that you all uh, who like to travel for those things keep your ears out and uh, come and, and be a part of those conferences in that sense. And uh, I do appreciate y'all's joining. I really do pray for you all, and our elders pray for some of you. You might know them, and if you don't know our other elders and some of our other fellow pastors, message me privately. I'll connect you in some of the groups we're in, and we can all just have a good time growing in the, in the grace of God. And uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. I love you all. Lord bless.